Shalom and welcome to Shomer Mitzvot, Torah Observant, a series on practical messianic living and apologetics. I'm the author, Torah teacher Ariel ben Lyman Hanavi. Torah observance is a matter of the heart. It always has been and always will be. The Torah proper instructed the people of Israel to love Adonai your God with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your resources. This is where Shomer Mitzvot begins, by loving Hashem and accepting Him on His terms. By this, I mean accepting His means of covenant obedience. For today, this means acceptance of Yeshua, His only Son, for Jew and non-Jew alike. Shalom and welcome to Shomer Mitzvot, Torah Observant, a series on practical messianic living and apologetics, otherwise referred to as halacha. I'm the author, Torah teacher Ariel ben Lyman Hanavi. This commentary is entitled, Grafted into Israel. Note, all quotations are taken from the complete Jewish Bible translation by David H. Stern, Jewish New Testament Publications Incorporated, unless otherwise noted. The written commentary was updated on November 10th of 2005. You know, nearly 1900 years ago, the Apostle Paul, otherwise known as Rav Shaul, found himself being challenged by the risen Yeshua on a most important mission. Our Lord chose to commission this Pharisaic Jew with an urgent message to the Gentiles. What was that message? Let's pick up the reading in Romans chapter 11. I'm going to read verses 13, and then I'm going to jump down to 17, and then read verse 18, okay? Quote, however, to those of you who are Gentiles, I say this. Since I myself am an emissary sent to the Gentiles, I make known the importance of my work. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, a wild olive, were grafted in among them, and have become equal shearers in the rich root of the olive tree, then don't boast as if you were better than the branches. However, if you do boast, remember that you are not supporting the root. The root is supporting you." End quote. That passage has uh, such a wealth of information, I wish we could spend more time and just exegete the entire uh, chapter uh, 11, but if we were to do that, and be honest to the text, we'd have to start in chapter 9 because that's where the thought starts and it doesn't stop until chapter 11. So uh, I want you, the reader, to go back uh, and, or you, the listener, to go back and read the passage for yourself sometime if you've never read Romans chapters 9 through 11. I strongly suggest it. As I read the passage, I am of the opinion that a most wonderful truth is being discussed here. What does it mean for Shaul to say that, quote, the wild olive tree, which we know is a reference to the Gentiles because he explains that to us, what does he mean to say that the wild olive tree is grafted into the cultivated olive tree? And uh, we can uh, make a very, very safe assumption that the cultivated olive tree is none other than the people of Israel, the natural branches. Uh, the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What does Paul mean when he tells us that one is grafted into the other? Well, as I read down to the passage, um, I am a strong advocate for uh, believing that the Bible was written in a language that should be understood by the average person. You don't have to be a seminarian to understand what the Bible is trying to tell you. Uh, it helps to be uh, a trained, um, but uh, I believe the Bible was written for everyone and, and every person should be able to uh, grasp the uh, central meaning of what the text is trying to give to us. And so, in my opinion, the plain sense of the text this time is not easily confused. So, in a series of bullet points, one, two, three, four bullet points, I'm going to summarize what I believe Paul, the apostle, is trying to teach us, at least in this passage. And then from there, we're going to see if we can develop some uh, practical application and that's why, of course, these series are called Shomer Mitzvot, or um, uh, Messianic Living and Apologetics. Uh, many within the Messianic movement are seeking some definition as to what Messianic Judaism is. Uh, are we a legitimate Judaism? Are we a legitimate stream 
of of uh, the believers of God, the followers after Hashem, and um, in many in many ways we are uh, illegitimized in the eyes of normative Judaism, and yet if we find our authority by the very Word of God, that is to say, the entire Word of God, both testaments, if I can use that term, uh, Old and New Testaments, as the Church would describe them, then we should have no. Um, misgivings when it comes to our identity in Messiah. God has redeemed us, both Jew and Gentile, and we need not shrink back from that central reality. And one of the ways that we can uh, begin to uncover our identity in Messiah is to read what Paul has left for us, a legacy of, of a truth that is, um, uh, uh, how should I say, uh, it was given to the first century uh, communities where Jew and Gentile were, were, were bumping into one another and formulating their, their new communities. But at the same time, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, has preserved this body of truth for us, what, what Paul has given to us, has preserved this body of truth for us. And I believe that nowhere is it more pertinent than today in the emerging Torah communities. So let's go back to the text, or rather let's go back to my commentary and look at these bullets, and then I'll just... Um, uh, comment on each one. The first bullet reads, quote, Through the efficacious ministry of the Messiah Yeshua, Gentile believers are covenant bound to Father Abraham's olive tree, which is Israel, of course, thereby making them fellow citizens and full participants with the commonwealth of Israel. You can look up Ephesians chapter 2 and you'll see. Um, and because of this covenant position that Gentiles enjoy, they are indeed granted the divine privilege of following the whole of the Torah. Now, that first bullet alone is enough to cause consternation to many within, how shall we say, normative Christian circles today? You ask any average uh, Gentile believer in Jesus, and, and most of them wouldn't refer to themselves as Gentiles, but what I mean by the term Gentile there is just the, the um, working definition of someone who does not consider themselves a Jew. But you ask your average, uh, take a, take a, a, a poll, a, a, um, um, a survey, if you will, um, and many well-meaning believers, Gentile believers, are led to believe that they are not part of Israel in such a way that it would grant them the divine privilege of following the whole of the Torah. To be sure, most Gentiles aren't taught that the Torah is relevant for them anyway. And this is a shame, in my opinion, because God's words and God's ways and God's truths are timeless. They don't change. God gave his Torah to Israel 34, 3,500 years ago or so. But the truths that God gave to Israel were meant for the surrounding nations who would find themselves grafted in to Israel. And that's what this whole commentary is about. Grafted into Israel means grafted into the family of God. There's only one family, and the family is Israel. Therefore, the church, if I can use that term, finds her identity in the covenant of Israel. If she finds herself outside the covenant of Israel, then that's a bad place to be. Okay? More on that later. The second bullet reads, quote, We believe that God himself, Yahweh, has written this very same Torah upon the hearts of those Jews and Gentiles who have placed their trusting faithfulness in Yeshua. You can read Jeremiah 31, uh, chapter 31, verse 31 through 34, as well as Hebrews chapter 8, verses 7 through 12, which, of course, Hebrews is a quote from Jeremiah. And you'll see that one of the features of the, quote, New Covenant, or New Testament, I, I, but it's better couched in the language of New Covenant, um, or Renewed Covenant, to be sure. At any rate, one of the um, um, phrases that is found in those verses is that God says, I will write my laws upon their hearts. Now, it's not just any heart that God writes his law upon. Rather, it is upon the circumcised heart, the heart of flesh that God has promised he would take out of us, I'm sorry, that he would put within us after he took out the heart of stone. So when we place our faith in Yeshua and our heart becomes circumcised and tender, I, I would say, then it is the active agent of the Ruach HaKodesh who writes the Torah on our hearts. And I'm not just talking about God's moral law that God writes on there. 
Rather, we have no right to dissect his law into moral, ceremonial, and civil, uh, moral, civil, and ceremonial. No, God writes the Torah, and that's what the uh, what what the pasuk, what the passage uh, uh, tells us. And so we'll we'll talk about that a little more as well. Anyway, the third bullet point says, "Quote: We believe that this same Torah is a foundational revelation of the righteousness of Hashem, and serves as a description." along with the rest of the scriptures, of course, of the lifestyle of the redeemed community. This time you can reference James chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. Now that's a good bullet point to stop and uh, dwell on. We believe that the Torah is a foundational revelation of the righteousness of God. What do I mean? God's standards of righteousness, what constitutes sin, what constitutes righteousness, these standards are not standards that are um, composed by men. God never imagined that man would create his own righteousness. No, God designed man to walk into the righteous standard that God himself establishes. Therefore, if we will surrender to the Spirit of God and accept his Son Yeshua as our one and only means of atonement, then of course God is going to make it available to us through his righteous standard. But not only that, he is going to cause us to walk into the righteousness that he has designed for us to walk into all along. And so we today are searching, especially in the Messianic community, the Torah communities, we're searching here and there for what standard of living we should pattern our lives after. And we need to look any further than the pages of God's wonderful Torah. And of course, I mean by Torah there, the entire 66 books of the Bible. Okay? This last bullet point reads, quote, Furthermore, grafted in bespeaks of our affirmation to our true identity as a people, Jew and Gentile, that is securely rooted in the finished work of Yeshua HaMashiach. Grafted in, to Israel. How do we get in? God does the engrafting. Jew and Gentile both find themselves in a state of, of, of sin, shame, um, disappointment, confusion, corruption, and ultimately death. Outside of the salvation agent uh, supplied by the right arm of the Lord, aka Yeshua himself, outside of God drawing us to himself, we have no hope. Now, of course, I'm speaking to the choir. Those of you listening to my podcast or reading my commentaries, you know, of course, that it is only through Yeshua that we can find a, a, a place in the world to come, that we can find a place in heaven, that we can find a place in God's covenant. However, what becomes confusing to many, at least in the emerging Messianic communities and the Torah communities that are, are being formulated today, is that both Jew and Gentile form this body. Jew and Gentile together comprise the body of Messiah, and it is because of the finished work of Yeshua that we can call each other's brothers. Jew and Gentile don't replace one another in the body. The body doesn't uh, become all Gentile, uh, once a person becomes a believer in Yeshua, any more than it becomes all Jew. No, the duality of the um, identities between us, Jew and Gentile respectively, um, the pairs, if I can use that term instead of duality, uh, the pairs, the Jew and the Gentile, we both complement one another. We need to live together. We need to learn how to work together as one body if we're to be an effective light and witness in, the, in this world today. And that remains to be one of the primary problems within the Messianic movement. In fact, I'm, I'm fond of quipping, jokingly of course, that one of the biggest problems with the Messianic movement today is the first four or five, I'm sorry, the first five or six letters, messy, M-E-S-S-Y. We are quite messy because we, we still have not figured out that Jew and Gentile have equal roles and equal standing within the body of Messiah. Jews look down their nose at Gentiles, Gentiles look down their nose at Jews, and on and on and on the arguments go. And the world looks on and shakes their head and says, what kind of witness is that? I don't want any of that. Shame on us, people. We need to get our act together, and we need to, to, to grasp this central truth that Jew and Gentile are one 
in Messiah. But that oneness does not erase our distinctives. We do not lose our identity in Messiah. The one new man principle mentioned in Ephesians chapter uh, 2 does not mean that Jews cease to be Jews and Gentiles cease to be Gentiles. Otherwise, look what Paul just said here. Let me go back up to Romans chapter 11. What does verse 13 say? However, to those of you who are Gentiles, well, who the heck is Paul talking to if there are no more Gentiles? Or who is he talking to if there are no more Jews? No. Jews and Gentiles remain Jews and Gentiles, respectively. We both have our um, importance in God's economy, and I guess it remains to be seen exactly how God is going to work that out among us. But suffice it to say right now, we know that because of the oneness of, of the uh, atonement of Yeshua, we are both equal in God's eyes. We were equal sinners before we came to Messiah, and now we're equally precious in his sight because of Yeshua. This next section is entitled, The Righteousness of God. You know, as I read through Paul's letters, I, I, I like you, find that there are many confusing <laughs> topics that Paul seems to address. And most of it stems from um, a, an unfamiliarity with the first century Judaisms and the emerging Torah communities of the first century. And it's because history has um, hidden the details from us. We today in the 21st century find it difficult to trace our uh, roots back to the first century, especially when there has been 1900 years of uh, standoffishness between the church and the synagogue. The synagogue went one way, the church went another way, and never shall twain meet. And because of that distance or that animosity towards one another, um, it's very hard to peel back the pages of history and get any semblance of the truth. Nevertheless, I believe that we can, if we carefully study the pages of God's Word, all of God's Word. What that means is, for, my challenge to the, to the uh, synagogue today is, you want to understand the church? Pick up the New Testament and start studying it. I doubt many traditional synagogues will take up my offer, unfortunately. However, that doesn't mean that individual Jewish people can uh, or should not investigate the matter for themselves. Anybody can go to a bookstore and buy a Bible these days. It is the most popular book in the world. You can buy a Bible anywhere these days, and you can buy it in any language, including Hebrew. So I challenge my Jewish brothers and sisters who do not yet claim to know Yeshua, the Messiah. Pick up the New Testament. If that term New Testament offends you, then consider calling it the Apostolic Scriptures. Consider calling it the um, Latter Ketuvim. Consider calling it the uh, Renewed Covenant, the Brit Chadasha, as David Stern calls it. Whatever you want to refer to it as, it is the word of Torah. It is the truth of Torah. And it upholds the standards of Torah. I don't think you'll be disappointed if you read it for yourself. Conversely, the challenge goes out to the average Christian. Read the Torah. And this time I mean the first five books of Moshe. For too long, we in the church have ignored the foundational portion of our scriptures. We are ignorant when it comes to God's words and God's ways because we don't know what God even says we have not even read the covenant that God made with Moshe. We don't even read the book of Leviticus, the books of Deuteronomy. We don't know what the commandments are. Therefore, we don't know how to approach our holy God. And it is for that reason as well that we misunderstand Paul. Because Paul was a man who respected the five books of Moshe. And it's a shame that the church has inherited a tradition of anti Torahlessness, of anti-Jewishness, this, this preoccupation with running away from God's ways just doesn't make any sense, especially in light of the verses that I just read earlier, especially in light of what I said about the Torah being written on the heart of every regenerated person. Why would you want to run from that? It doesn't make any sense to me. And as long as we, the believers in the church, the Gentile branch, as long as we continue to run away from God's written Torah, we will find ourselves swimming in the waters of murkiness, uh, groping through the room of darkness, stumbling over the stones of offense. We will simply misunderstand Paul as well. So, let's look at Paul in his letter to Romans this time, and I want to pull one example and begin to um, 
describe what I believe, and when I say I, I'm not alone in this. There are many well-meaning scholars today who are beginning to peel back the layers of misunderstanding around this man, Paul, and begin to allow him to speak for himself rather than putting words in his mouth. And how do we know how Paul spoke? I'm not just talking about the language that he spoke in, Greek, Aramaic, or Hebrew. No, what I mean is, how do we know how to decipher Paul? Because surely he, 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 write, he writes things that are hard to understand. Even um, Peter said this, that he writes words that are difficult to understand and that people twist and distort to their own destruction. How do we know how Paul spoke and how he thought? Well, one of the ways that we're learning how to understand Paul a little better is to look at the extant writings that have existed down through the centuries. Writings such as the Mishnah and the, Tal and the, uh, the Gemara, the Talmud. Um, the rabbinic writings... Uh, were closer to the source or closer to the time of Paul than we give them credit for, especially since it was right after the destruction of the temple that uh, rabbinic Judaism formulated itself and began to um, create halakha among their followers. And so what we can find out is that Pharisaic Judaism, of which Paul was a part, um, survived the destruction of the temple and the exile from Israel, or the exile from uh, Jerusalem back in uh, the second, first and second centuries. Because rabbinic Judaism survived, there is a wealth of information that can be found if we allow ourselves as Christians to become familiar with the mind of the early rabbinic Jew, of which Paul is. So that's one way to figure out better uh, how Paul thought. Another way is to remember that Paul had a high regard for the Torah of God. And if we are to get inside the mind of Paul, we have to read the Torah because Paul quotes from the Torah consistently. Why? Because it was his only source of inspiration. Uh, I'm sorry, it was his only source of inspired scripture at the time. There was no quote-unquote New Testament just yet. Paul was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit when he penned his letters. However, we have to wait for the canonization of those letters later centuries. So, I'm just saying it this way. Hermeneutically, if you're going to understand Paul, you've got to read the Torah. Okay? So, with that in mind, let's go. The righteousness of God. In his letter to Rome, Shaul wrote in chapter 3, verse 28, that a person is considered righteous by God on the grounds of trusting, which has nothing to do with the Torah, or as the KJV puts, uh, puts it, which has nothing to do with the works of the law. So let me just read that verse out of the KJV here for you. Romans 3.28 reads, uh, here we are, quote, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Uh, I suppose I need to change my written commentary there. I put KJV works of law. It really should say deeds of law. Anyway, um, on the surface, as I read this passage where it says that righteousness and deeds of law are irrelated, it seems, on the surface, problematic for my own teachings that consider Torah observance to be of great significance, wouldn't you say? In fact, at face value, that is how the average um, uh, a church member reads the verse. However, the problem here is really more a matter of hermeneutics and theology. What Shaul is really talking about when he employs the Greek phrase ergon namas, translated here as works of law or deeds of law, is in actuality a technical phrase that the Judaisms of his day employed to speak of the halakha, that is to say the proper way in which a Jew is to walk out Torah. Now, let me pause there because I've just introduced the um, definition of the word halakha. Um, in fact, the series is entitled Shomer Mitzvot, um, a series on practical messianic living and apologetics. And if you look at the written version, you'll see in parentheses after the word apologetics, I have the word halakha. And many of you listening at this point might scratch your head and wonder, what is halakha? Well, on the one hand, halakha is a group identity. Halakha is that which separates one um, group from another group. Um, halakha is and can be the distinctives that make the group what they are. Um, their policy, their group policy, if you will. But in another sense, halakha is Jewish law. Halakha is that which is laid down in the Torah in written form, but then comes along in oral fashion or, or spoken form and helps to shape 
the way in which the person is to obey the written form. So you could say halakha is the humanization of the written law of God. It is the law of God put into practice. It is the wisdom of God as um, spelled out by the leaders of the community that wield that power or who sit in the seat of, of uh, leadership. Um, the rabbis of the communities have the right to develop halakha for their community. The pastors have the right to develop halakha for their church group, uh, for their, their members there. Um, and on and on and on it goes. The leaders develop the policies that the group follows. And that's a safe way to um, allow God's word and God's spirit to speak to the community. In fact, if we took it from its extreme opposite point of view, if every man simply made his own decision, then there would be no group cohesion. So we do need God's word and we do need the spirit of God. However, equally important, and I, I must add, we need halakha because God's word doesn't give us all of the answers concerning every situation that we may face in life. Rather, there is um, some personalization that takes place uh, as we chart our way through uh, the pages of God's word. There are spaces between the margins that w that the Word of God doesn't speak about, um, that we need to ask the Spirit, how should we do this? And halakha helps to fill that void. So halakha can be a good thing. Now it could be a bad thing too. And what I'm going to describe now for you is the halakha of the first century Judaisms, at least the, the uh, surviving Phariseeisms of Paul's day. They had a halakha, or a group policy, that, that helped define how they saw themselves and how they interacted with the world around them. And what was that halakha? Well, the prevailing view of the sages of the first century held to the common belief that Israel and Israel alone shared a place in the world to come. Now for those of you listening who don't know what the phrase world to come means, the Hebrew equivalent is olam haba. The, old, the, uh, the world to come is simply, the again, that dualism that the Judaisms of both then and now divide the entire age of man into. We have the olam hazeh, which is Hebrew for this age, and then we compare that to the olam haba, which is the age to come. To use Christian parlance, we would simply call it now and or, or we would we would we would call the olam hazeh this age we would call it the here and now and we would call the olam haba heaven i suppose that's what christians would call it uh your 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 life here on earth today and your life after you die and are resurrected in in the presence of yeshua the olam haba or the age to come is more or less what christians might call heaven at any rate the prevailing view of the first century sages held to the belief that all of israel inherited this place in the world to come. To use Christian parlance again, it would be the equivalent of saying that every single church member is going to heaven. When in fact, any well-meaning pastor knows that every one of his flock is not going to heaven. He knows that the people who sit in his pews week after week, he knows that not all of them have a personal relationship with Jesus. Some of them are just going through the motions. Some of them don't even know where they're going. They're just fooled. They're deceived. So, um, it would, if you were to uh, have a group that held to the party line that all of its members were on their way to heaven, well then it would help if you said that not only did every member go, or was every member on their way to heaven, but it would be um, even more defining to say that this group, and only this group, is going to heaven. So what would happen, or what would it look like if we had a church group, or a um, uh, a body of, of, of church members who firmly believed that every one of them were going to heaven, but only they were going to heaven. How would the outsiders feel? You're getting the idea now, aren't you? All right, well, that's what's going on in the first century. The Jewish people um, were led to believe by their leaders. That's why I say the sages there. Um, elsewhere, I call them proto-rabbis because they weren't technically rabbis yet. Um, uh, Rabbonim, maybe. Um, at any rate, the leaders were under the impression that God made a covenant with Israel and Israel alone. And that part is true. God did make a covenant with Israel alone. But in that covenant making, the leaders had come to the incorrect conclusion that Israel alone was righteous uh, salvifically and that because of, the, her ver uh, because of her being um, Israel, 
that she was guaranteed a place in the world to come, a.k.a. heaven. At any rate, if a non-Jew, read here as a Gentile, if a non-Jew wished to enter into Hashem's blessings and promises, such a person had to what? Convert to Judaism first. In other words, they had to be a Jew in order to be counted as one of the righteous. Now, this surely is one of the primary arguments delineated in the letter to the Galatians that Paul wrote. And it is this hermeneutic which helps us to understand Paul's difficult words, uh, phrases such as works of law, under law, uh, phrases such as circumcision, and things like that. Paul is combating a mistaken notion taught in the first century that just by virtue of being Jewish, I am saved, if I could use church language again. And not knowing that will cause you to read Paul and think that he's making up some nonsense about doing away with the law. So, concerning this conversion policy about turning a Gentile into a Jew on the, for the purpose of making them a covenant member, no such man-made conversion policy exists, existed in Paul's scriptures. And what scriptures were those? The Tanakh. The Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim, the Old Testament, to use church language. There is no conversion policy listed in Scripture, people. It's not there. The Torah is silent. Now, I'm not saying that it doesn't infer that people adopted other people into the family. We know for a fact that Ruth was adopted into the family. We know that um, Rahab the, Her uh, the harlot was adopted into Israel. We know that Caleb was a proselyte or a, a someone outside of the tribes of Israel and yet found his place in Israel. So we do have people joining Israel down through the pages of the Tanakh, down to the pages of the Old Testament. But there is no formal ceremony uh, equivalent to today's proselyte ceremony whereby a Gentile can and must convert and become a Jew in order to be counted as righteous in God's eyes. No, no, no. There is nothing there. By contrast, Shaul taught most assuredly that Gentiles, as Gentiles, were grafted into Israel the same way that Papa Avraham was counted as righteous by God in Breshit chapter 15. So in Genesis 15, we read how did Abraham come to be counted as righteous by God. How? Faith in the promised word of the Lord. Now, of course, that's code word for faith in Yeshua, because Yeshua is the word of the Lord. And you can reference John 1.1 1, 1 to be sure. Um, so Abraham placed his faith in the promised seed. Of course, we know that seed is Yeshua. And therefore, God, looking into his heart, counted Abraham as righteous because of that, that trust that Abraham had. Abraham was not counted as righteous because he was Jewish. When I say righteous here, surely you know that I'm speaking of forensic, forensic righteousness. Forensic righteousness can be, um, cal uh, can be termed um, justification for those of you who are not sure what forensic righteousness means. Abraham was saved, if I can use church parlance again. Abraham was saved not because he was a Jew, but because he placed his trust in God's word. That's exactly the same formula or requirement that Paul puts forth in his letters, and that is the exact same requirement that I'm putting forth today under the authority of, of the uh, Scriptures. The Bible teaches emphatically that there is only one way for God to count you righteous salvifically, and that is to place your trust in Him, and that means placing your trust in Yeshua. So the phrase, works of law, that we just read there in the passage, or KJV said deeds of the law. The word, or the phrase works of law, uh, remember Paul's writing in Greek, um, uh, Aragon namas, the phrase works of law also has a Hebrew counterpart. And the Hebrew counterpart is ma'aseh ha-Torah. And so, how do I know this? Well, the um, surviving extant writings known now, or known today as the Dead Sea Scrolls, have used this phrase. And um, it's, from these documents that we have since translated, uh, that we now understand this phrase, works of law. What meaneth ma'aseh ha-Torah? The Dead Sea Scrolls use this phrase as well, and since the discovery of those manuscripts, we've now come to know that it, ma'aseh ha-Torah, or its Greek counterpart, ergon namas, that this phrase refers to, quote, some of the precepts of the Torah, end quote, as adjudicated by the halakha, remember the prevailing halakha of the first century, that only Jews are saved, and, and 
it's adjudicated by this halakha and by the particular community wielding the most influence. In this case, it was the Pharisaic uh, leaders who wielded the most influence over their students here. To be sure, it's the Pharisees who survived the destruction of the temple. The Sadducees were disbanded, and we've not read about them since. Surely, or to be sure, the halakha that teaches, and listen carefully, the halakha that teaches both then and now that Gentile inclusion only by way of conversion, read most often as circumcision in Galatians, that conversion policy, this, this policy was naturally at odds with the true gospel of Gentile inclusion by faith in Yeshua plus nothing. Do you see how they're at odds with one another? On the one hand, let's hold out your hands, hold your left hand and your right hand. On the left hand, you could say you have this policy that says you can only be considered righteous if you are Jewish. And if you were born Jewish, then you inherit it automatically. But if you're not born Jewish, then the only way for you to gain this righteousness is if you convert to become a Jew, and in other words, become circumcised if you're male. That's the policy on the left hand. Now on the right hand, we have policy that says, doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile, Greek or uh, um, um, barbarian, you are all sinners, and the only way to be considered righteous is if you place your trust and faith in the man of righteousness, Yeshua himself. Now, if you hold your hands out and look at these two policies, you will see automatically that they are competing with one another. And that's why Paul calls it another gospel in the book of Galatians. He's not talking about Torah observance. He's talking about the identity that finds itself rooted in one's ethnicity. That's the other gospel. And if we understand that quite often Shaul's use of the term circumcision in Galatians is actually shorthand for, quote, the man-made ritual that seeks to turn Gentiles into Jews, end quote, then the letter begins to make more sense Hebraically and contextually. I might also add that once we understand that that's what Paul's um, combating, a misuse of identity, then the Torah itself becomes exonerated. Paul's not against the Torah, whether written or oral in that sense. He's against the mistaken notion that the righteous person is a Jew only. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles, and he's trying to get the Gentiles to understand that they have been grafted into the body of Israel as Gentiles. That's the mystery of his gospel. Oy. With this knowledge at hand, we are now prepared to better interpret Paul's pasuk, his verse. Let's read the verse again. Romans chapter 3, verse 28. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. The Greek there for deeds of the law is ergon namas. A person is considered righteous by God on the grounds of trusting, which has nothing to do with the Torah or the law. What Paul is really saying, now that we know that works of law there is the halakhic requirement that a Gentile must become a Jew before he can be considered righteous, that's what the phrase works of law means. It doesn't mean doing the Torah. It doesn't mean Torah observance. It does not mean obedience to the commands. No. What, sh what um, works of law or ergon namas means is the policy that requires a Gentile to convert. Um, you could just say it conversion, or you could just say it circumcision. In that day, you could call it circumcision. At any rate, if we place that mean back into this verse, then what we really see the verse saying is, quote, a person is considered righteous by God on the grounds of trusting, which has nothing to do with the conversion policy that seeks to make Gentiles into Jews first, end quote. That makes more sense historically, Hebraically, contextually, and theologically. Okay? I promise you, Paul is not combating Torah observance. At least he's not combating faith-driven Torah observance. He might be combating a legalism that seeks to pervert the Torah into something it would never was. But the first century Judaisms did not look at the Torah as some simplistic tool that one could wield in order to make his way into heaven or the age to come. That's not how the first century Judaisms looked at the Torah. Rather, they looked within themselves and said, we're Jews, and because we're Jews, we're in. By the way, if you think about it in that way, it's really grace. Because which Jew became a Jew, the ones who were born Jews, which one of them chose which family to be born into? None of them did. 
And so they saw it not as a work, but as God's grace. That was the blindness, because it's couched in the language of truth. It is true that it's God's grace that a man can be born a Jew. But it's not true that just because he's born a Jew, he's automatically saved or guaranteed a place in the Olam Haba. And that is the blindness that Paul is combating in his first century letters. This next section is entitled Law versus Grace. Now, that term alone, law versus grace, is it's a hot potato, people. I, I, you can do a Google search for the term law versus grace, and, they're, and, and the, the commentaries on this topic are legion. And most of them are written by the church. <laughs> um, that's not to say that there's um, not an interest in law versus grace within the Jewish camps, but rather um, there seems to be a wrestling within the body of Messiah today, at least the, Christ, the, uh, uh, the Gentile side or the Christian side, with the notion of how much of God's law do we have to keep? How much of the Torah has been done away with? And myriads, multiple myriads of sermons have been taught that the law has been suppressed for the Gentiles. The law has been uh, um, done away with for the Gentile believer. And therefore, the, the, the average Christian has no uh, relevancy to the law. The law doesn't matter to him anymore. He needn't concern himself with the Sabbaths and with the dietary laws and with the festivals and with wearing tzitzit these types of things. And that is unfortunately a wedge of contention between the church and the synagogue. The, the synagogue will not listen to a gospel message that does not take the Torah seriously. You want to evangelize Jewish people? Get right your view of the law first. Get right your understanding of, 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 of God's words to Moshe before you attempt to witness to an observant Jew who holds the Torah of Moshe in high regard. And I might add, Paul is one of those Jews, and I am too. So, law versus grace, what's it all about? God is the God of both Jews and Gentiles. It's very simple. We know it innately, but we don't, we don't walk like it's true. We get puffed up in pride. We get big-headed as Jews. We get, we get proud, uh, uh, prideful as Christians and think that we are better than, our, than um, uh, the other. We Jews are better than Gentiles. We Gentiles are better than Jews. Nonsense. We're both equal. We're both equal sinners. We're both equal covenant partners. If we find our place in God's family among the righteous as those who have placed their faith in Yeshua, we are equal then. One need not change his station in life before God can accept him. Gentiles do not need to cease being Gentiles and become Jews in order to be counted as righteous before God. Conversely, Gentiles do not see, I'm sorry, Jews do not need to cease to be Gentiles to become, and become, um, let's try that again. Jews don't have to become Gentiles. Gentiles don't have to become Jews. You know what I'm trying to say here. We are who we are. And as a Jew or as a Gentile, we simply need to rec wrestle or reckon with um, the Son of God. That is the change in our station. Uh, that is the change that takes place in a person's life. In fact, the real change that takes place in a person's life is not ethnic. The, the real change that takes place in a person's life is affected by whom? The Ruach HaKodesh, the Spirit of the Holy One. When, because of Yeshua's bloody sacrificial death, the sinner takes on the status of righteous. You see, there's the change in status there. Sinner becomes righteous. Not Jew becomes Gentile or Gentile becomes Jew. That's nonsense. That's not a necessity. I'm not saying that it can't happen, and I'm not saying that in some cases it might not be, um, how shall we say, advised. But what is mandated or, or, or necessary in God's eyes is that the sinner becomes righteous. Man cannot add to that which God perfects. God reaches down inside of a sinner, whether he's Jew or Gentile, and changes the heart of the, excuse me, changes the heart of the individual from darkness to light, from stone to flesh, from uncircumcised heart to circumcised heart. God perfects the individual. God brings the individual to the goal, a conversion to Judaism in the first century, a.k.a. circumcision. This conversion, in Paul's mind, added nothing to those people, those Gentiles wishing to be counted as true Israelites in the Torah community. 
Gentiles wishing to join Israel did not need to become Jewish, Paul teaches. Why? Because only God can change the heart. Conversion doesn't change the heart. You can change the spots of the leopard, but, but, but it doesn't change the inside of the animal. Paul knew that well because he was steeped in Pharisaic Judaism. He knew firsthand what the darkness of an uncircumcised heart looked like. And he also knew what it meant to be a Jew who believed that his righteousness was attained because he was a Jew. To Shaul, the genuine faith of the Gentiles in the promised word of the Hashem, as evidenced by the genuine working of the Spirit among them, was all the identity that they, the Gentile, would ever need. That's why he's the apostle to the Gentiles. What's he telling the Gentiles? You know what he's telling them? I can tell you what he's not telling them. He's not telling them to run away from Torah. That doesn't make any sense. What he's telling them is to run into Yeshua, but not to convert to Judaism before. That's what Paul's telling them. Because once counted as righteous by the righteous one himself, Yeshua, all the new Gentile believer needed to do was to begin to what? Walk into that righteousness. A walk already described in the pages of the written Torah. A walk formerly impossible due to, to the deadness of flesh and the bondage to sin. So, Paul's beginning to make more sense to us now, isn't he? And if you're a Gentile Christian listening to my podcast today, I want you to understand something. Paul had respect for the written word of God. Paul kept the Sabbath day, the seventh day Sabbath. Paul kept the festivals. Repeatedly throughout the book of Acts, we find Paul um, expressing his desire to get back to Jerusalem to keep the feasts, if possible. Paul kept kosher. Paul didn't eat that which was treif, that which was forbidden by Le Leviticus chapter 11 and Deuteronomy chapter 14. Paul kept the dietary requirements. Paul honored the Torah of God because Paul knew that as a believer in Messiah, a Jewish believer in Messiah, that his faith did not nullify the word of God. In fact, using Romans 3 again, if we look at the rest of the passage there, I started in chapter 3, verse 28, but let me read verse 29, 30, and 31 for those Gentile Christians listening to my podcast who are having some doubts as to Paul's view of the Torah now that he was a believer in Yeshua. What does Paul say? Verse 29. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Verse 30. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Verse 31. Here's the clincher. Do we then make void the law through faith? Obviously, it's a rhetorical question that Paul answers for himself. God forbid, yea, we establish the law, end quote. People, it couldn't be clearer. Paul didn't have anything against the Torah of God. The Torah was not the problem. The problem was a heart clouded by sin. The problem was a heart clouded by pride in one's own ethnicity. The problem was the inner man, the stony heart. That's the problem in Paul's letters. The problem is not the Torah. And so why would Paul attack the Torah? That's not the problem. Paul attacks the problem. The problem is ethnocentric Jewish exclusivism. That's the problem in the first century. So, we in Messiah today who claim that we're free in Jesus, listen up church, we who claim that we're free in Messiah, do we even know what biblical freedom is? Whenever someone tells you, I'm free in Yeshua, stop and ask yourself, free to do what? Free from sin, that's true. But free now to do what? Let me tell you what it is. Biblical freedom is not a license to walk away from the Torah. Biblical freedom is liberation to walk into Torah and into the righteousness that Hashem envisioned for us all along. That's what biblical freedom is. Thus, let's say it this way. Positional righteousness always, always, always results in behavioral righteousness. 
Put plainly, Torah submissiveness is the natural result of being set free from sin and set free unto Yeshua. That's biblical freedom. So, this ages old law versus grace argument, it's a dead argument, people. Let it die a well-deserved death. There is no incongruity between God's law and God's grace. The two are complementary. They stem from the same gracious God. To be sure, it's God's grace that actually empowers the believer, the saint, to do what? To walk into Torah obedience. That's what Paul understood. If he took the Torah away from the new believer, what standard of righteousness do they have to live by? If the Old Testament is being done away with in the New Testament, then how are they to walk as newly formed communities following the Master? People, that just doesn't make any sense. It cannot be that way. And it's because of that error that the church has inherited for the last 1900 or 2000 years that the Jewish people today look at the gospel and say, nonsense, I want nothing of it. I don't want to follow a Jewish Messiah who leads me away from the law. Because most Jewish people today, to be sure the rabbis, understand that the law is forever relevant for the child of God. And so we, the church, have to play catch up because we've listened to the lies that the adversary has given to us down through the ages of, of church history. The law is done away with. The law is no longer relevant. You're no longer under the law. That type of stuff is what, those lies are what um, helps keep the separation between Jews and Gentiles today. And I'm here to do my part in reconciling Jew and Gentile one, to one another, especially the Jews and Gentiles who have confessed Yeshua as Messiah. Now the Jew and Gentile who have not confessed Yeshua, the only thing I can offer you to, come to terms with God's truth. Fall on God's mercy because you're both headed for a devil's hell. Jew and Gentile outside of the Messiah or Jew and Gentile outside of God. It's that simple. What are my conclusions? This next section is the conclusion to this commentary. Failure to continue in genuine trusting faithfulness for either Jew or Gentile participants invited God to place them in a position that Shaul called, quote, broken off, end quote. In other words, Going back to our tree metaphor, natural branches, Jews, could be broken off because of what? Lack of trust. Lack of trust in whom or what? Lack of trust in God, which today means lack of trust in Yeshua. Gentiles, as well, the grafted in branches, could also be broken off due to what? Lack of trust. Read Romans chapter 11 very carefully. The same solution to the problem carries with it the same penalty for breaking faith with God. Jew and Gentile are equal sinners. And when the Messiah atones for a Jew, that Jew is made a covenant member, a genuine lasting covenant member. But by the same vein, when the Messiah's atonement reaches out to a Gentile, the same thing happens. He's brought into the family of God. Therefore, Jew and Gentiles are brothers. We don't lose our identity as a Jew and as a Gentile any more than a man loses his identity as a man when he becomes married. My wife is still a woman, and I'm still a man. And because of the pairs, the man and the male and the female, a true marriage is formed. There is no marriage between a man and a man, and there is no marriage between a woman and a woman. It will never be. It's absurd. It's nonsense. It's confusion in God's economy. We need the different... Um, we need the... the, the uh, uh, the complementary identities to make up a true marriage. Male and female come together and form a marriage. Using that same logic or that, that example, we see that it takes Jew and Gentile to make up the genuine body of Messiah. We cannot all be Jews and we cannot all be Gentiles. And yet, as Jews and as Gentiles, if we break faith with God, which would report in my opinion that we never had faith with God, but if we break faith with God, then God has no choice but to stand by his covenant agreement, spelled out in the pages of his Torah and in the pages of the apostolic scriptures. God has no choice but to do what? Break us off. 
And that's what Paul's trying to teach us here in Romans chapter 11. Far from purporting that some ethnic-driven halakha secured one's place in the Olam Haba, the age to come, the native-born Jew, the Ezrach, the convert Jew, and there are converts, I, I understand that, and the good old-fashioned Gentiles, they all face the same penalty for remorseless lack of faith. And what is that penalty? Spiritual death. So, we see that the Torah is the universal document for both peoples, and it outlines God's plan for all of mankind, both Jews and Gentiles. The mystery of the gospel is that Israel is actually comprised of both Jews and and Gentiles. To be grafted into the family of God is to join oneself to a Jewish olive tree. I use the word Jewish there simply because God made the covenant with Abraham's natural offspring in such a way as to describe them as Jewish. To be grafted into the family of God is to join oneself to a Jewish olive tree without having to succumb to any kind of man-made conversion policy whatsoever. To this end, one becomes submissive to the instructions and righteousness of God and inherits the blessings of God, whether he is of Gentile or Jewish stock. To walk in disobedience and lack of trust is to invite God's punishment and withholding of blessing. Don't do it, people. You don't want to do that. You don't want to go there. You don't want to be on the receiving end of God's curses. To belong to the family is to mentally, spiritually, and physically accept the family rules. When you said yes to Yeshua, when you said amen to Jesus, you signed up as a covenant partner. And guess what that covenant spells out? Obedience. To this end, both Jews and Gentiles are expected to practice Torah submissiveness within their hearts and within their communities. We are Torah communities, and that should be the characteristic of our families. To submit to God is to desire and allow His Holy Spirit, His Ruach HaKodesh, to continually mold a person's life into the example of the Son of God who vividly displayed a beautiful, Torah-obedient, and submissive life. This is the responsibility of, of a believer today. To suppose that faith outside of resulting action alone is pleasing to God is to misunderstand the valuable lesson explained by James, by Yaakov. Such faith, if we could call it that, such faith is barren and of no value to God. Or as James explains, like the body is without the spirit, it's dead. Conversely, to mistakenly replace the genuine faith that the Torah teaches with some halakhic rule designed to regulate one's identity with God is to misunderstand Rav Shaul's valuable lesson. These are two ditches that we must avoid. We must ride the high road of God's holiness, avoiding the ditch of legalism on the one side and the ditch of lawlessness on the other. If we find ourselves walking into the faith of God but failing to demonstrate genuine faithful actions, then such actions prove to be displeasing to God and unacceptable as righteous. That concludes our show for today. It is my desire that this continuing series of teachings will assist the average non-Jewish believer or new Messianic Jewish believer in his desire to become a more mature child of God. And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways, to love Him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. 
to the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth, and everything in it. Yet the Lord set his affection on your forefathers and loved them. And he chose you, their descendants, above all the nations as it is today. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. Because the Torah is written on the hearts of all who truly name the name of Yeshua as Lord and Savior, it is meant to be followed to the best of our ability. We have no reason for fear of condemnation or the trappings of legalism. My name is Ariel ben Lyman Hanavi. The intro and outro song were written, produced, and performed by Ryan Kingsley. For more information on contacting Ryan, you can reach me by email at yeshua613 at hotmail.com. That's Y-E-S-H-U-A number 613 at hotmail.com. Or visit our website at graftedin.com. That's graftedin.com.